Hello, welcome back to Brian. Uh, I hope you had a great, great dinner. Um, your belly's full, ready for some more talks. Because um, I am. I didn't have dinner, but uh, I, I'm ready. Uh, are you ready, Benji? I'm ready. You are. Great, great to be here, everyone. <laughs> great to have you. Uh, you're talking about monorepos, right? That is correct. Yes, a controversial topic on which I have strong opinions. Amazing. Your slides are ready. I'll, I'll leave it to it. Appreciate that. Thanks. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, thanks for attending my talk. I uh, hope you've all had a great conference. My name is Benji, and I'm one of the core contributors to Pants, which is an open source build system. And today we're going to talk about Python code base architecture and specifically about monorepos. And I know that this is a controversial uh, topic on which there are many opinions. I am going to present mine, and I fully acknowledge that there are others. Um, a little about me and uh, why it is that I came to have a lot of strong opinions here. Uh, I've worked as a software engineer for many years. I uh, have had the good fortune to work at some really great companies. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm a maintainer of the Pants open source uh, developer workflow system. And uh, in the last couple of years, I have been a co-founder of Toolchain, which is a startup in the uh, developer tools space. So a quick overview of this talk, basically three parts. Uh, I'll start by defining terms. What is a monorepo? What do I mean when I use that term? Uh, a bulk of the talk will be, well, what, why would I want one? Um, and the last part of the talk will be about um, say you're on board with wanting a monorepo, what kind of tooling makes working in a monorepo effective? So let's jump right in to uh, what is a monorepo. So there is one thing that is a common characteristic of kind of basically every code base, almost all code bases that any of us are working on, and that is that they grow over time. And they grow because you have some set of developers that are adding code over time. But also if you're hiring and your team is growing, then you're adding more developers who are adding code over time. And so your code base can grow uh, faster than linearly over time. And there's a very common consequence to this, which is that builds uh, get slower and less manageable. Uh, they become unstable, uh, they become um, unbearably um, slow and clunky. Now, I can already hear the objection forming in some people's minds, what do you mean by builds? Python is not a compiled language. So I'm using the term build, and if you don't like the term build, you can substitute developer workflow in the general sense. So it's every step that you take from when you hit save in your editor to having an artifact that's ready to deploy. So for example, resolving and downloading your uh, external dependencies or generating code or type checking, or running tests obviously is a big one. Um, debugging in a REPL, linting, formatting, actually building and packaging those deployable artifacts. Python definitely has a build, it just doesn't have a build time compiler. Uh, so that's what I mean by build. And again, these, all of these get slower and less manageable as your code base grows. So what do we do? As your organization and your code base grows, we have basically two architectural alternatives to how to manage that code base in a scalable way. And those two are the multi-repo architecture versus the monorepo architecture. And I should mention that obviously this is a continuum. You don't have to be at the extreme end of either of them. Um, but generally, this is the these are the two poles through which this continuum goes. Now let's start by talking about multi-repo. Multi-repo means as your code base grows, you actually split it up into a growing number of small or you know manageable size repos. And typically you split them along team boundaries or project boundaries or library boundaries. And very often this kind of happens naturally because it's the path of least resistance. The easiest way to get a handle on scale is to just take an ax to your code base and just carve it up somehow and worry about the consequences later. And we will obviously talk about those consequences soon. But there is an alternative. And the alternative is what I refer to as a monorepo. Um, and the monorepo is you keep a single unified growing code base 
that contains code for multiple projects, multiple services uh, that share underlying dependencies uh, and tooling and best practices. Now, uh, a monorepo, for example, may contain code for multiple in multiple languages, or even in the same language, it may contain code uh, relating to multiple frameworks. And typically, you'll have different parts of your team working on different but overlapping parts of the monorepo. Very often, they will overlap on exactly those shared dependencies. And as your code base grows, as your organization grows, your single unified monorepo grows along with them. Now, I should emphasize that. Um, we are talking about code base architecture, not deployment architecture. So a monorepo is ag uh, as, as an architecture is agnostic to whether you deploy uh, you know, a few large monoliths or you deploy many microservices. And in fact, there are often many advantages to deploying microservices out of a monorepo because when you have a great many services, they have to, they share dependencies and in particular, they often share um, protocols. Um, because that's how they talk to each other. And so it is often very helpful to have those be in the same repo. Um, and that leads me on to the second part of this talk, which is, okay, monorepo defined, why should I want one? And I will freely admit that multi-repo does sound better at first. Um, it's more decentralized. Uh, it allows you to make local decisions. Um, you, you can sort of do your own thing uh, in your monorepo. You can put a boundary around it and sort of maintain order uh, in your repo and keep all the barbarians from, from other parts of your team out of your code. It sounds good, and, and these are good buzzwords. Uh, and there are cases when I think that is actually valid. Um, I'm not um, a total fanatic here, but there are a set, there is a set of core problems in code base management that multi-repo not only doesn't solve, but it hides them. It obscures the problems until you encounter them down the line. Uh, whereas a monorepo makes these problems explicit so you can reason about them. And there are various ways to convince yourself of this. Um, because of shortness of time, I've boiled it down to uh, really one main um, point that I want to make, which is that uh, from my experience, uh, the hardest code base problems are managing changes and managing dependencies. And the overlap, the intersection of these two is particularly tricky. It is where so much of the pain of code base management uh, lives. And to the extent that we can pick a code base architecture that makes handling these problems easier, I would argue that we should consider doing that. So when we think about managing changes, um, in a world of dependencies uh, or managing dependencies in a world of changes, let's look at first how these challenges are handled in a multi-repo world. So multi-repo relies on publishing. So if you have a bunch of repos and you know some of them consume some code, some library or some utility from repo A, it has to publish an artifact, say in Python, that would be an SDist or a wheel or whatever. Now, when I say publishing, this could mean to a private internal uh, corporate repository, not necessarily to public PyPI, because remember that we're talking about an organization's internal code base here. So we rely on publishing, but unless repo A never changes, which I mean, let's be realistic here, it will. Um, it's not just that you need to publish, but the artifacts you publish need a versioning scheme. So when you make a change or someone makes a change to this repo a they have to republish that under a new version and why because otherwise those changes might break the existing consumers of repo a at the old version so if you know to look at a more specific example here if we have repo b that depends on repo a it does so at a specific version so now say you're an engineer working in repo b and you need some change to this upstream dependency so first you have the organizational task of finding out who owns repo a are, you know figuring out are you even empowered to make a change in repo a but let's say that you are or you've convinced the owner to make the change that has to be published under a new version and then you need to consume that new version presumably in a new version of your repo and now something needs to happen and you have two choices when it comes to uh, change management through these dependencies 
So first of all, you can decide to be a good citizen and make the virtuous choice. The virtuous choice is you find all the other consumers of repo A, and there could be many, um, you ensure that their code still works with your change, you modify those repos as necessary until say their test passed or until you've figured, you know, qualified that your change is good for them. And that is a lot of work uh, because first of all, how do you know who all the consumers of repo A even are? Remember that uh, dependency consumption metadata lives on the consuming side. So repo A, there's no metadata in repo A that says here is the universe of my of, of other repos that depend on me. So you have to find them somehow. Then you have to figure out, well, how do I test the change? What do, how, do I know enough about this repo to even run its tests or you know, figure out how to qualify that this uh, change is good? But let's say I figured all that out and I've done it. Um, I'm still not done because I actually have to do this recursively. If I made any changes to the direct consumers of A, so repos, you know, sure, I made changes to B because that was why I started this whole uh, laborious piece of work. But say there's, you know, C, D, and E that also depend on A. If I've made any changes there, then I have to recurse this process and I have to find all the consumers of those libraries or those repos and do the whole thing over again. This is a tremendous, uh, there's a lot of friction here. It's a tremendous amount of work. So even though, um, you know, being a good citizen is good, but very often you end up making the, I would call it the lazy choice, which is I'm not even going to worry about the other consumers of repo A because that's what versioning is for, right? They're safely pinned to that earlier version. And when those other consumers need to upgrade, I will let them deal with that problem. But this isn't very nice because by the time they have to do that upgrade. Uh, they may have no context for your change. You may have lost context for your change. Maybe, maybe you're not around anymore. Um, so essentially what you've caused is, you know, the problem famously known as dependency hell. Um, you have, you have effectively caused these other repos, uh, potentially you've caused a dependency resolution problem where if they don't upgrade, but they depend on A through two different paths, they may end up with two different versions, uh, which is impossible. Like one of them has to be picked and it's possible that neither of them will work. And this is exactly what I meant by hide the, the multi-repo hides problems. It allows you to essentially push responsibilities off onto other people at a future time. So you've left a little time bomb in the code base uh, and that is not a great way to be uh, part of a, of a productive and cohesive team. So that was multi-repo. But in a monorepo, there's no versioning or publishing. All the consumers, uh, again, we're talking about a continuum, but in the extreme case, at least all the consumers are right there in the same repo. You can find them using like rip grep or whatever your you know, code base comprehension uh, utility of choice is. Uh, you can run all the tests. Uh, you can run all the tests in the repo. You can run just the relevant tests if you have the right tooling to do that to ensure that your changes are good. And any breakages are immediately visible. You're essentially making self-contained changes that are guaranteed, like if, if you are scrupulous about running tests and so on, they're guaranteed to be good at head. Like you, you are keeping everything in lockstep. Um, and so you can see an example here, a really important one in my opinion, of how code base architecture actually enforces good teamwork and uh, responsibility. So more generally, this was a big example. I would argue that um, even though it seems counterintuitive, monorepos can often be more flexible than the alternative. So for example, they are easier to refactor. Uh, they're easier to debug because you can uh, transit easily through all the sources that uh, affect your, your the, the uh, code under debugging. Uh, you have unified change history, so it is very easy to reason about uh, the uh, mutation of the code over time. It's easier to uh, discover and reuse code because everything's right there in this, in this uh, single repo. Putting repo boundaries between different parts of your code base uh, reduces flexibility. And my last point here, and more generally, is that I have found, I have seen from experience, without naming names, that the code base architecture is very often a reflection of uh, the structure and functionality of your organization. So 
there are many cases where localized decisions and creative chaos are desirable, sort of wisdom of crowds type thing. But an engineering organization is not a bottom up kind of thing. Like by its very name and nature, it's organized. And in a well functioning engineering team, priorities and decisions and effort allocation flow top down and some sort of top down organization is required. And an engineering organization's code base very often reflects those organizing principles. And I think this is why many large companies, uh, you know, Google, Facebook, Twitter, many others have adopted this monorepo architecture uh, because it helps keeps the organization unified even when they're at huge, huge scale. Um, so that's kind of what I had to say about my, my sort of advocacy in favor of uh, monorepos for Python and in general. But focusing a little bit on Python, I did want to, um, for the remainder of this, talk about tooling for a Python monorepo. So we are accepting that we, you know, for, for the sake of argument, we've accepted that we want a monorepo. How do we work in one effectively? So the observation is that standard Python tools, the tools that you all use every day from PyTest to PIP to MyPy to Flake 8, to you name it, generally are not really designed for uh, monorepo architecture. Typically, they rely on, uh, the reasons are that they rely on global state uh, and they rely on sort of side effecting into the file system. They, they leave virtual ems and files all over the place and they're expected to be there when you need them. And as a result, small changes tend to trigger full reruns of, of whatever task it is you're doing, whether it's running tests or running, um, I don't know, uh, MyPy for type checking. Uh, lint as formatters, you tend to sort of run them universally. Um, the tools generally are designed to expect that they run on an entire uh, package hierarchy on an entire repo. Now, some individual tools may have special case mitigations for some of these issues, but it's very ad hoc. So typically when you end up using, when you use these, these tools sort of naively in a growing uh, monorepo environment, they do a lot of repeated work and that slows things down. So how do we speed things up? Really, there are two ways to speed up work. There's one is do less of it, and the other is do more of it concurrently. To do less work uh, in this context of uh, developer workflows, you really need two, fe two important features. You need fine-grained invalidation, namely the ability to analyze at a, at a pretty fine grain what the effects of changes are, and caching so that if work has been done before, you don't have to do it again, done by you or potentially done by someone else on your team if you have shared uh, remote caching. When it comes to doing more work at once, first of all, you need to be able to reason about concurrency. You need some system that can say, these pieces of work are allowed to run at the same time. They can run concurrently because they don't, one does not depend on the output of the other. And you want to at least have support for uh, remote execution so that uh, instead of concurrency being limited to the number of cores on your laptop or on your CI machine, you could potentially have dozens or hundreds of cores working for you at the same time. So what kind of tooling has these features? Um, to work effectively in a monorepo, unsurprisingly, you need a build system designed for that. Now, these build systems, or, or more generally developer workflow systems, don't reinvent the wheel for the most part. Um, you want one that sits on top of existing standard tooling, but it orchestrates them for you. It figures out when to run which one and on which inputs. And so these tools tend to be very different from things like make or tox or, or running the underlying tools directly, like literally just running PyTest directly on the command line. And there are good reasons for those differences and we will get into some of them. So fortunately such tools exist. Here are some examples of them, um, I uh, and there are several others. Now, I am freely declaring my bias here. I am, as I mentioned, one of the core contributors to Pants and have been for many years through two uh, major rewrites of it. So I'm naturally biased towards it. Uh, but I, I will mention to back up that bias for this audience that Pants was uh, the, the most recent iteration of Pants that we launched last year was specifically designed with Python use cases in mind. So it's not tacked on to a C++ uh, system. It is, you know, we designed for Python. Uh, but I, each of these systems has their strengths. Uh, 
And they tend to work in similar ways if you squint, which is uh, what I will uh, go into for the remainder of the talk. So there are many interesting aspects to these tools. Um, I'm going to look at three that kind of, to me, stand out and, and what makes them different from uh, other types of tools you might be familiar with. And the three are um, that they have a goal-based command interface, that they rely on build graph metadata, and that they uh, implement a workflow uh, that has no side effects and relies on no side effects, and that you can extend with custom logic. And I will now go into what I mean by all of this. So um, let's start with the what I refer to as a goal-based uh, command uh, interface. So with a monorepo build system, you don't say, you know, run pip on this or run pytest. Instead, you specify, I want to achieve a goal. And these goals are generic verbs like test or package or lint. And the system translates that into uh, execution of underlying tools like PyTest, setup tools, PyLint, Flake8, whatever, MyPy, whatever tests, uh, whatever tools uh, are necessary here. This is important for a couple of reasons. One is, um, to support uh, in it's necessary to support invalidation and caching like you need a conceptual layer between what the user wants to achieve and the expensive part which is actually running processes because maybe you don't need to run a process maybe uh you can resolve um, get a result from cache or maybe uh you don't you know you only need to run it on some subset of files so you let the system figure that all out for you and so you can see some examples here of the types of command lines you can run. You can say run on this file. You can run on this glob of files. You can run on just files that have changed in uh, Git since uh, this tag, that kind of thing. So that's what I mean by uh, goals. The uh, next point I mentioned was um, the uh, build graph, the idea of this uh, code dependencies. So monorepo build systems need extra metadata to figure out sort of the packages and the dependencies between them and like what the structure of your code is. Some tools require this to be very explicit and handwritten uh, and other tools and pants included can infer this uh, metadata by looking at import statements and other aspects of your code. And having this data allows the tools to do fine-grained invalidation. So if a file changes, we know uh, which transitive dependencies are affected. So now we know, for example, which tests might need to be rerun and which tests can be skipped or resolved from cache. Uh, and another example of how this data is used is that the system knows which internal and external dependencies need to be packaged into your deployable binary, because in a monorepo, you may have multiple binaries that you're deploying. And with a standard tooling, you know, you sort of have to pull in an entire requirements.txt, for example. Um, and you know you might need many requirements.txt if you had different requirements for different uh, servers and keeping them in sync is difficult. Whereas a monorepo tool can just um, slice out just the dependencies you actually need. So these are code dependencies. There's another type of dependency that these systems care about, which is um, the uh, dependencies between units of work. And, and this is a static mapping that you can construct at startup time before any work is actually run. Um, and what it is, is just a set of rules that knows how to transition between inputs and outputs. And these rules form a graph that maps the initial inputs, which are things like files on disk and the uh, and sort of state, um, to final outputs, which is the goal that the user requested. So you could imagine work just flowing through this graph from uh, output to input to output to input uh, until you achieve a final result. Uh, and this is where the extensibility comes in you can in all of these systems because everybody has you know very many organizations have little custom scripts and build steps you can plug them right in there uh, into this uh, rule graph uh, and and it runs exactly the same as uh, any other part of any uh, built-in rule and this is where we get to the workflow so those based on the code dependencies plus the task dependencies you can create a, a both of which are static. You can construct a dynamic workflow at runtime, and what actually runs depends on invalidation, on what's available in the cache, and so on. And the uh, important point here is that this workflow uh, relies on no side effects, causes no side effects other than outputting the final result, and it has no global state. 
And why is that important? Because that is what enables concurrency and remote execution, right? Think about it. If you rely on local state or you rely on side effects, you cannot run, um, you cannot take work and parcel it out to a uh, remote uh, system, to a cluster um, with any kind of confidence. So this explicitly modeled workflow um, enables these four features, which if you remember from a few slides back, was ex were exactly the features which speed up your builds and make it uh, scale as your monorepo grows. So to sum up, um, I claim that uh, monorepos are an effective code base architecture in many cases, that they require appropriate tooling, and fortunately, this tooling exists. Uh, and I have been fortunate to have had a hand in creating some of it. So uh, thank you all so much for listening. I'm very happy to uh, take any questions. Uh, and um, you can find us at this URL. Uh, Pants is uh, part of a very friendly open source community, and we're always happy to help out um, with any build questions you may have. So thank you again. Thank you, Benji, for the great talk. So there's there's quite a few questions, not a lot of time. So I'll, I'll just go quickly through them. Have you tried using having dependency versions for all projects in their own separate repos? Like the example of the Maven project, that's the parent project, which defines the actual versions of. So having dependency versions for all projects in their own separate repos. I'm not sure I understand the question. Is this where there is a project that specifies all the dependencies? Um, I, I'm, I'm not super familiar with that, to be honest. I don't want to give a glib answer here. I suspect mm -hmm. that you still end up with the um, problem of, so the problem is less where you maintain the ver version numbers and how changes flow through your dependencies. And I'm not sure that this would solve that. But again, I, I'm not entirely sure what the, uh, I'm not entirely sure I understand the question. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Yeah. Next one, do you, do you just need to have the same release cadence for all products in a monorepo? Oh, great question. And uh, no, you, you actually don't because, well, you always, regardless of architecture, need to make sure that if you're deploying servers and clients, like services that talk to each other, that they are capable of talking to each other through the upgrade. Uh, and that's a problem that uh, in many cases, uh, you know, that is a, a, a nuanced problem. Uh, but no, you can actually release different parts, different services, uh, whatever cadence you like. There's no requirement to have the same release cadence. Good to know. And how do tools like Pants compare to tools like Poetry? Do they have different purposes? Uh, yes. So interesting question, because we actually, in the most recent version of uh, Pants, the one that we will be releasing uh, in a few days, uh, now has Poetry support. So I mentioned that these tools orchestrate underlying tools. And now uh, Pants is able, uh, at this most recent version, to consume uh, Poetry uh, dependencies from your pyproject.toml. And I think they do have somewhat different purposes. Again, Pants is much more about orchestrating a wide variety of tools when you have multiple, uh, potentially when you have multiple binaries, multiple, uh, uh, you can, uh, where you may have uh, multiple distributions uh, and packages that you're releasing from the same repo. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not a regular Poetry user, but I'm more familiar with it as a tool that you use predominantly to manage uh, sort of a set of dependencies in a yes. single world. It, it, it's sort of poetry again is one of those tools that expects to own the world. Um, <laughs> and again, we we now and we now support it. Yeah, you have you have many tiny worlds inside the same repo. Right. Yes. So the example would be for you know if you have ten different services that you're deploying from your mono repo, um, a tool like Pants can say, okay, poetry determines the universe of dependencies I can. Uh, select from, but Pants will actually slice out just the ones that you genuinely need based on your actual dependencies. So you can, you know, if only one server needs this big heavy library, only that server will use that bit, will, will be deployed with that big heavy library. Right. Last question then. Um, in a modern repo, how do you distinguish uh, Git changes from different parts of the repo? Um, so again, I'm not entirely sure I understand the question. Um, you can 
so I can explain. Uh, yeah, please. So, so, so just because I, I put the question in, I'm assuming oh, that, yeah. that there's different services uh, inside the mm -hmm. same repo. Yeah. So like, so there will be like a change that's unrelated to the to the whole product by itself, but it's right. just specific to a service, for example. I see. So I would actually distinguish between looking at Git and just looking at changes in general. So uh, Pants, for example, has you have the ability to say, I don't really know what changes have happened. I, the, I don't know which parts of the code base I care about. I care about the ones that have changed in Git. So just figure that out for me. And you, you saw an example of a command line like that earlier. But the way change management is done in general is through content hashes. So essentially, if a result has been cached, you can say, you know, run these tests or run these subset of tests and work has been cached based uh, entirely and purely on content hashes. So if no changes have propagated, if, if no changes, where no changes have happened, the fingerprints will remain the same and the work uh, can be uh, recovered from cache. Uh, where uh, anything has changed, the fingerprints will change. And uh, so essentially these tools do their own change detection. Uh, mm -hmm. Git is a layer on top at the sort of user interface level where you can say, I happen to know as a user that the changes I care about are these changes in Git. But that is not what uh, any of these tools use to uh, detect changes uh, for robustness, for, for if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Right, so change Thank detection you. is Thank done so through fingerprinting. Sure. Um, happy to take more questions in chat or come find us online. Yes. Go to the breakout uh, uh, group and if you want to ask Benji some more questions. Thanks again. Cool. Thanks, everyone.